This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. In this episode of Northgate News, we'll examine what the future might hold. From how athletes will be held accountable for their private lives, to the upcoming Brazilian Olympics. We'll also meet runners who have foregone shoes, and we'll explore one possible future for America's energy needs. With the Olympics coming to Rio de Janeiro in 2016, Brazil is pouring millions of dollars into transforming the favelas, which are known for their abject poverty and high crime. O Rio de Janeiro não é uma cidade maravilhosa. É maravilhoso cenário para uma cidade. On October 2nd of last year, the International Olympic Committee set off a celebration when it chose Rio de Janeiro as the first ever South American city to host the Games. Rio 2016. Two weeks later, with the celebration hardly over, drug dealers shot down a police helicopter right in the middle of the city raising doubts that Rio can guarantee safety during the Olympics six years from now, much less in 2014, when the World Cup comes to town. The city has an international reputation for violence, but this violence is concentrated. Many neighborhoods here are just as safe as any big American city. However, it's a different story in Rio's ghettos, the favelas, home to more than a million people, where daily life is disrupted by constant battles between police and drug gangs. So what is the government doing about it? Well, with the Olympics on the way, Rio is putting all its chips on a new plan to clean up the favelas. They call it pacification. In practice, it's a full-scale military operation to run out the drug dealers and bring in more police. To date, seven favelas have been pacified. I caught up with police commander Lima de Castro after a press conference marking the latest operation. Nossa finalidade maior, primeiro, é resgatar essa parte da cidade, principalmente da cidade do Rio de Janeiro, para o Estado. Segundo, mostrar para as pessoas que elas não podem mais continuar subjugando os outros com armamento de guerra. Então, o problema não é a venda da droga, o problema é o armamento pesado que essas pessoas usam para se encastelar. Aí quem sofre com essa população. Sounds simple, right? take away the guns and the violence disappears. I went to one of the already pacified favelas to see if it works. I'm standing at Morro de Dona Marta. This is the poster child for the pacification plan. And today, this community has not only one of the most beautiful views in the city of Rio, but it's also one of the safest places to be. Zé Mario dos Santos is a community leader here in Dona Marta, a favela close to tourists and future Olympic sites. No wonder Dona Marta feels so calm. Three police stations, street cameras and 120 policemen, one for every 50 residents. Você acabam conhecendo os moradores pelo nome, sabe onde mora exatamente, conhece a família, sabe o que que a pessoa, onde a pessoa trabalha. Porque ali à direita. Exatamente, aqui na parte superior. And some evidence the plan is working. No homicides reported in over a year, and drug arrests have doubled. Então tem coisas boas chegando também. Né? Só que a gente não pode parar de cobrar. Porque se a gente parar de cobrar, as coisas se acomodam. E vai ficar no que a gente sempre viu, que foi só a Secretaria de Segurança trabalhando nas comunidades. Aqui não, a gente, aqui a gente não quer que fique só, só com a Secretaria de Segurança. A gente quer todas as secretarias atuando aqui. A de esporte, a de cultura, a da saúde, a do emprego, a de obras públicas. State legislator Marcelo Freixo says the pacification plan is a superficial solution to a much deeper problem. O tráfico de armas e o tráfico de drogas é muito lucrativo. Esse dinheiro não está escondido atrás de uma árvore em nenhuma favela do Rio de Janeiro. Esse dinheiro está na especulação biliária, está no mercado financeiro. E quem controla isso provavelmente nunca sentiu o cheiro de uma favela. O tráfico de drogas, que é violento, é crime desorganizado. É um exército de esfarrapados, descalços, desdentados. Isso é mão de obra barata. By the end of the year, the government says it plans to occupy 40 favelas, home to 300,000 people. As the World Cup and the Olympics draw near, the program will likely grow. Vai ter que ocupar todas as vai ficar assim milhões de, de policiais nas mais de 600 favelas do Rio de Janeiro. 
vai, vai, ter, vai ter, ou só vai ocupar as principais, que aparece mais para a imprensa. Paulo Lins wrote City of God, adapted to a film that introduced American audiences to Rio's favelas. Dita pacificadora, mas é o que quer. São vários homens armados de fuzil até os dentes no meio da favela. I wanted to see what a non-pacified favela looks like, so I left the prime location of Dona Marta and headed 10 miles north to Maré, a much larger favela in the outskirts of the city. Hoje de manhã, eu estava descendo, teve um tiroteio. Eu dizia, minha filha estava indo para a escola, eu tive de voltar com ela e ela não pôde ir para a escola. O complexo da Maré é uma cidade dentro de uma outra cidade. Só que ela é dividida. Amaro Domingues moved to Maré in the 60s, when the favela was still marshland. I met him at a sports and education Aí? complex he helped build 10 years ago. Nós resgatamos essas pessoas, damos, damos condições a ele, está compreendendo, para que ele possa se integrar na sociedade. The complex has the timely name Olympic Village, and a few professional athletes have started here. But more importantly, it's a refuge from drug dealers and police alike. De primeiro é difícil, pra gente que não tá com pau, hoje um indivíduo e na rede fica pau, pau, pau. A gente tá um bom, mãe, pra mim é maravilhoso. As crianças via deles têm o que fazer, eles não estão à toa. There are 8,000 kids who frequent the Olympic Village, but the complex can't reach everybody. Tem uma uma grande massa que é semi-analfabeta, que não consegue entrar no mercado de trabalho, que não sai do morro, é difícil descer do morro, que não vive, que vive nos sinais, que vive pedindo esmola. É dali que são os traficantes, é dali que são os grandes bandidos, é dali que são os assassinos. São os mais pobres entre os pobres. Aconselhar. Um barriga cheia é muito bom. Eu quero ver aconselhar com barriga vazia. Porque não adianta você pegar um jovem aí com 14 anos, que já é pai, tem filho, e não tem como estudar. Vai estudar como? Vai se alimentar como? Assim que eu chego da escola, eu sou de tarde. E aqui na Vila Olímpica eu sou de manhã. Então, assim que eu chego da escola, eu já vou logo cuidar das minhas irmãs, dou banho, boto pra dormir, dou comida de vez em quando. Que eu trato elas como se fosse, como se fosse minha filha. Assim, como, como se fosse minha, minha filha. Eu tenho 10. Mas quantas irmãs? Eu tenho umas 10 irmãs por aí. Ui! Tia, eu tenho menos do que ela, tia. Eu tenho oito, eu tenho oito irmãos. Pai, o que seus pais que seus pais fazem? Meu pai, é. meu pai morreu. E sua mãe? Trabalha aqui. Trabalha aqui na né? Foi uma invasão que, que teve. E ele ficou no meio da linha de fogo, quer dizer. Ele, os caras mataram. Como assim? Mata um bicho, um cachorro, não tá valendo nada e foi por isso e ficou por isso mesmo. Regina Mateus lost her husband six years ago. She was left with eight kids and no job. Now she works at the Olympic Village and her kids are doing okay. But shootouts like the one that killed her husband still happen all the time in her neighborhood. Between now and the 2016 Olympics, Maré is likely to be pacified. Todo mundo fala violência e tira mais a violência como tráfico de droga, arma, tiro. Mas a violência é tudo aquilo que tira de você o seu direito. A melhor coisa que tem para acabar com a violência é Papel, caderno, lápis. Se eu não tivesse força e sangue para trabalhar, meus filhos estariam como? No, na droga, ou lá embaixo vendendo bala. E eu que falo para eles, estuda, senão vocês vão usar uma bota pesada igual a minha. Lógico que você escolhe um, uma cidade para sediar uma Olimpíada, sediar uma Copa, aquela cidade vai receber melhorias. Mas tem que ver que tipo de melhoria que a gente precisa, né? When it comes to some elite athletes and their reckless lifestyle, some say the real problem is plain and simple, and common, entitlement. I get pressure from, from scouts, you get pressure from these guys called advisors that, that want to represent you. 
in the in the draft, and uh, everybody everybody wants to see you do well, which is encouraging on one hand, and uh, kind of puts a lot of pressure on you on the other hand. Being a football player at SC is just like probably being a football player anywhere else in the NFL, because this. The school in LA, like we're the only football team in the city. So I can say everybody in the city like crowds around us. You could almost argue it's kind of maybe the unusual person who goes through that whole regimen, if you will, for years and years and years and ends up being normal. There's nothing normal about the lives of celebrity athletes. It's a world of huge payoff, public adoration, and temptation at every turn. It's also a world of giant sized egos. You have to have ego, or you cannot succeed. Cal football legend Joe Cap knows about success. He was the quarterback the last time the Cal Bears went to the Rose Bowl in 1959. You know, ego's gas. But a good coach channels it, works with it. But the confidence and dominance that define athletes on the field can spill over into their personal lives with bad results. Take Tiger Woods and his appetite for porn stars and party girls. Or Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Ben Roethlisberger. He faces his second rape allegation. So why do celebrity athletes who have everything, fame, fortune, beautiful wives, risk it all? It's not just sex, says sports psychologist Bill Cole. It's entitlement. The entitlement is I'm really special and um, I deserve more than other people. Friends, family, the media, even coaches and teammates can enable athletes' overblown egos and sense of entitlement. They get special treatment because they're needed. So a lot of things are overlooked. I know he comes late, but he's a star player, whatever. I know he's not really a team player. Yeah, he's throwing his racket, but you know, we need him. So as the old expression goes, you know, people on a team might say, yeah, we're all equal here, but some people are a little more equal. At a big sports school like USC, athletes tend to be the most equal students on campus. Everyone knows about the athlete who might be the next multi-million dollar sports star. Sophomore wide receiver Bryce Butler is getting used to the attention from fans. Some people do some amazing things. Like they'll have your picture like in a card, like a sports card, and they'll be like, hey, I'm a so, such and such from like Idaho. I'm an SC fan, I love you, whatever, can you sign these and send them back? But it's not just the players and fans, it's the system too. I was head coach for two Division I uh, college programs and, and I had at least one athletic director tell me, if you can get a blue chip person, I don't care how big a jerk he is, get him. You want free spirits. You can't have uh, a team, uh, a game like the game of football without free spirits but there's also a sense of judgment. You need, you need good judgment. It's usually poor judgment that gets players in trouble and supplies tabloid headlines to a scandal-loving public. I cheated. There's a lot of bad boys and bad girls in pro sports that perform brilliantly, but their personal life is a mess. So they, they have these two boxes, at least two boxes, where they can be messing up like crazy over here, even criminal activities and different things like that, and then just press a switch and boom, they get on the, the playing field and they seem to have it all together. When we go on the field, like, we have a sign that says, like, lock in. It basically means, like, when you walk on the field, do not bring anything that's outside, you know, the football field to practice. If you have a money issue, a family issue, whatever, block that out for this three hours that you're going to be on here because right now, this is not what we're on the field for. We're on the field to play football. I mean, I think at this stage, everyone's so confident or so um, adamant about focusing and, and being focused on the game and stuff that they don't realize that later on there's going to be a lot more distractions. But whatever distractions these young athletes may face at the next level, it's the last thing they're thinking about right now. Any team, any, anywhere, I'll, I just want to play professional baseball in the major leagues. Whatever it takes for me to, you know, do the best I can here to help me get to the NFL, I do. So I've been doing it for a long time, so I can't stop now. Solar power promises a clean solution to the energy crisis, but a new plan has environmentalists sounding the alarm.
For the first time ever, there is enough momentum behind large-scale renewable energy projects to actually build them. We're on the cutting edge of a major transformation here. We're transforming the way we fuel the world's largest economy. And that is an audacious thing to try to do. A coalition of former rivals, business, politicians, and environmental leaders is joining together to generate one-third of California's energy from renewable sources in the next 10 years. I am convinced that whoever builds a clean energy economy, whoever is at the forefront of that, uh, is going to own uh, the 21st century global economy. But so far, none of these projects has broken ground. The reason? The most promising location for large-scale solar in California is also one of the world's largest and most pristine desert ecosystems, the Mojave Desert. Well, I think the problem is that, that after decades of desert preservation on the part of conservation organizations, now we're faced with something that's potentially devastating. But what's devastating to the local Sierra Club is a necessary sacrifice to its national leaders. If we wind up not doing what we need to do and 20% of desert species go extinct in the next 80 years, is that acceptable? I don't think so. The pressures of climate change, along with $60 billion in federal stimulus money, is attracting solar companies from around the world to the Mojave. Nearly a million acres could be developed, an area roughly the size of Rhode Island. I don't think there's any question that this is a land rush, and it's all in the name of global warming, but it's really about capturing the solar market and building big, what are called centralized plants. It means all the power is going to be produced in one place and carried over their lines to the market. Nine major solar projects are on a fast track to start building before the end of the year, when the stimulus money dries up. BrightSource's 4,500-acre installation in Ivanpah Valley will be the first. Ivanpah represents what's great about this industry. When it's constructed, it will be the largest solar plant in the world. Um, it'll actually nearly double the amount of solar thermal produced here in the, in, in the U.S. today. Um, it'll also generate 140,000 homes worth of electricity here in California. But not everyone agrees that large-scale solar is the best solution. Why are we looking at doing solar energy uh, in this type of environment where we have to scrape and surrender lands before we cover our rooftops or do this in the already built environment. It doesn't make any sense. Although there are enough homes and businesses in California to generate all of the state's power from rooftop panels, some believe that installing them would simply take too long. There's a tremendous amount of scale that we need to get to in order to address climate change. Some of that's going to be met with rooftop. Some of it's going to be met with wind, but the reality is, is that utility cell solar has to be a part of that, and because it's a unique resource to California, we should take advantage of it. Many developers have agreed to build on land that is not considered critical habitat, but some locals feel it's still too big a sacrifice. This particular area here, as you can see, is not blighted, it's not disturbed, it's not sun-scorched. It's healthy, valuable, intact ecosystem. An ecosystem that is home to a number of threatened and endangered species, like the desert tortoise. Locals fear that once the land is cleared for construction, it will no longer support life. That's the case with this abandoned plant in Daggett, California. I think the desert is also a very underappreciated and, and misunderstood ecosystem uh, worldwide. People that have not visited the California and Southwest deserts I think picture the Sahara or the Gobi or, or some other desert and that paints a very different picture. Many environmentalists advocate building on private farmland instead. You guys see this truck wall over here? But the federal government has offered developers public lands at a much cheaper price, including 600,000 acres that conservationists donated to the government to protect from mining. We just crossed the Nevada state line into California and we're now in the the Castle Mountains parcel. Um, there's currently 9,000 acres of proposed solar in, in this 29,000 acre parcel. And there's also wind applications on the ridges. These lands are very dear to us. And the experience that we've had on the ground tells us that, you know, although we have an urgent need to have solar energy, we also have an equally urgent need to protect these most valuable places. Trying to strike a balance between development and conservation, Congress is considering expanding the borders of the Mojave National Preserve, 
but much of the desert could still be developed. You have to wonder if there are not better places to do it. It only makes so much sense to cut down Joshua trees to save Joshua trees. This is the trade-off that environmental leaders are now facing, and some are landing on the side of big solar. The big projects are what is going to deliver what we need in the short term. Johanna Wald has worked to protect public lands for decades. Now she's helping solar developers build on them. There will be compromises. For me, the compromise is the environmental impacts, the direct and the indirect and the cumulative impacts that those projects will have. That's a real compromise. That's the thing that's, you know, that's hard for me and it's hard for other people. You know, I'm the first person in the Sierra Club's history whose job it is to try to figure out where to put transmission lines. You know, usually we're fighting all transmission lines. The climate change has changed all of that. Future generations are going to rely on us to do what's necessary now, not to try to just keep punting this into the future till we've hit some tipping point we can't recover from. For now, all eyes are on California, watching to see if big solar, big business, and big government can manage this desert ecosystem without destroying it. Running in bare feet is like yard work in the nude. It's not for all weather, and your neighbors will likely stare. Still, it's a trend that's seeing rising popularity. Running is a fairly low-tech sport. You need a good pair of shoes, and you're on your way, right? Well, maybe not. There's an increasing chorus of voices saying that even shoes are unnecessary. So many people today in our society today think that in order to run, you need some kind of very, so I call it an orthotic shoe boot. You know, you need some kind of cushion, supportive thing to help you because... This is Barefoot Ted, a running coach who teaches workshops geared at training athletes to run without the aid of their shoes. The more we've added cushioning and support to our footwear, the more disconnected we've become to this, our own inherent natural capacity to move, which relies on the capacity to feel. Ted isn't alone in this philosophy. The popular nonfiction book, Born to Run, highlighted the Tarahumara Indians of Mexico. The Tarahumara are one of dozens of modern tribes who, wearing little more than a sandal, can literally run their prey to death. The idea is that although an animal can run faster, humans can run longer. The book argues that all runners have the natural capability to do the same. You have to really pay attention all the time. 50-year-old Michel Legault has been a runner all his life. He decided to lose the shoes six years ago and hasn't looked back. I always stop when somebody goes, oh, that must hurt. Because I, I definitely want to talk to those people and tell them, no, I'm not a masochist. I don't like pain, but no, no, that's not the way it is. It's just actually really, really fun. The buzz around barefooting grew louder after a recent Harvard study determined that habitually barefoot distance runners tended to land with a forefoot or midfoot strike, while shod runners land on their heel. The study determined that the barefoot runners could move easily on hard surfaces without discomfort from landing. I want to get into a gentle flow. Many people interpreted these results to mean that running barefoot leads to less chance of injury. Sales rose for minimalist shoes, such as the Vibram Five Fingers or Nike Free, to protect bare feet. But Barefoot Ted says that posture, a quick cadence, and a gentle step are all the protection you need. If you're running like this, and you land on something sharp, hard, uncomfortable, slippery, whatever, you're under your next footfall. You're under your next footfall. You're under your next footfall. You're never fully committed to, your in, to it taking that impact. I want to see your feet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're kind of dirty, <laughs> but instead of being hard, there's, it's more like a pliable material that's uh, supple, like a good leather. So does this mean the end of traditional running shoes? Probably not. Shoes are helpful in controlling normal foot motion. In running, the body weight shifts with each step. Pronation occurs as the heel and ankle roll inward and the arch flattens out to absorb shock. The majority of the, po the population has some degree of pronation. Matt Bell, who studied human biomechanics, says the gait of the runner and the way the foot strikes the ground contribute more to injury than what's on the feet. And when you see too much of that pronation and that arch rotating in, 
um, how it affects some of the soft tissue around the foot and ankle, how it translates up the leg because of the rotation of the bones. That's where we tend to see a lot of those kind of problems and a lot of those kind of, of injuries. I see nothing wrong with barefoot running. Uh, the biggest problem is very inconvenient. We'll go the other side. Craig Norton is a physical therapist at La Foot Plus. Very few injuries are caused by impact. Most of them are caused by torsional forces. There, don't move. I can name off like posterior tibial tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, uh, iliotibial band tendonitis, patella femoral. They're all, most of those are all torsional. They're not impact. And that's a big fallacy. So what about the Terra Humara and Barefoot Ted and other avid barefooters? Jump up, land, recover, get into a relaxed state. They seem to be doing just fine. Norton says that while anyone could run barefoot, they run the risk of injuring themselves unless they gradually switch from shoes to bare feet. Well, as you shod down and you have less and less support, your muscles have to get stronger and stronger. Most people don't want to go through that. And then they roll into their... Many barefoot advocates agree there needs to be a training period to learn proper running technique, but that it's worth putting in the effort. You can learn really good technique and still keep your shoes on. Okay. Not perfect, because because these two guys, my feet, are really good coaches. They tell you immediately if you're doing something wrong. Because they go, ow, that hurt, which you can kind of mask over in shoes. The greatest gift our ancestors gave us, in a way, is capacities we have within our own body. And reconnecting with those are, not only are they powerful and they allow you to become fit, but that fitness and that ability to move smoothly, I think is connected to sort of happiness or just joy.